In the early hours of June the 6th, 1944, preceded by airborne landings to secure their flanks, British, American and Canadian forces began landing on the beaches of Normandy to open Operation Overlord, the Allied campaign for Northwest Europe. The Germans were taken entirely by surprise, a tribute to the brilliant Allied deception plans and the incompetence of Hitler's intelligence service. Only one panzer division was deployed within reach of the beaches. Many of the defenders were reservists, convalescents, East European conscripts. Yet some coastal pockets fought with surprising determination through the first vital hours of D-Day. And for the invaders, Beyond the difficulty of breaking through the defences, there was the immense problem of bringing ashore hundreds of thousands of men, thousands of tanks, vehicles and guns across open sands in the confusion of battle. In the British and Canadian sectors, at Gold, Juno and Sword beaches, the first waves broke through the coastal crust with light casualties. But the timetable for Montgomery's planned dash inland towards Bayeux and the city of Caen was quickly broken. Rommel's men did all that could have been expected of them, fighting against the best of the Allied armies and vast air and firepower. They checked the momentum of the advance, denying the invaders a quick breakthrough. The great traffic jams of tanks and landing craft on the beaches cost the British precious hours to overcome even when the defenders were crushed. In the American sector, on Utah Beach, currents drove the 4th Division ashore several hundred yards south of their intended landing place. But by fluke, this proved the most lightly defended stretch of the entire invasion coast. The Americans pushed rapidly west along the vital causeways inland to establish a frail but priceless link with their airborne bridgeheads. Eastwards on Omaha Beach, the 1st and 29th Divisions assaulted the strongest German defences of the day and came close to foundering. All through that bitter morning, the infantry lay pinned down by crippling fire on the sands and beneath the bluffs covering the shore. At one point, Bradley, their commander, almost broke off the assault upon Omaha, and most of the men upon the battlefield shared his terrible fear that the landing had failed. Only after hours of stagnation and some 4,000 casualties did a few bold handfuls of Americans force their way up the blazing hillside to outflank the German defenders. Inch by inch, they cleared a path inland from the beach. The American command plan for Omaha failed, but the courage and initiative of a few score men on the spot forestalled disaster. By mid-afternoon, American forces had gained the high ground. By nightfall on June the 6th, the Allied commanders savoured the huge relief of knowing that the first great risk of the campaign had been overcome. Their armies were established on the coast of France. At a cost of only some 2,000 men killed, more than 140,000 were already ashore, digging in from Wiestrom to the Cherbourg Peninsula. The London Times went to press that night, declaring with a pride that was shared through the nations of the Grand Alliance, four years after the rescue at Dunkirk, of that gallant, defeated army, without which as a nucleus the forces of liberation could never have been rebuilt, the United Nations returned today with power to the soil of France. For one man, the relief of escaping disaster on D-Day was perhaps most overwhelming of all, Winston Churchill. After the landings, the Prime Minister visited the armies in Normandy with the Chiefs of Staff. To Stalin he wrote, All the commanders are satisfied, that in the actual landing, things have gone better than we expected. This front will be constantly nourished and expanded, but all waits on the hazards of war. In the first days after June the 6th, a deadly race began between the two rival armies in Normandy to build up their forces upon the battlefield. Despite the legend of the longest day, the Allied planners had always predicted that it should be possible for the best of their troops to gain a foothold against some of the worst of the Wehrmacht on D-Day itself. All their fears concentrated upon the period that followed when invaders and defenders strove to outmatch each other's strength week by week.
I am greatly concerned about the situation that may arise between the 30th and 60th day, Churchill had written to Roosevelt the previous winter. Though the town of Bayeux was seized and the five Allied beachheads fully linked within the first week, progress inland proved disappointingly slow. The Germans fought hard and skillfully. Defenders dug into the close-set hedges proved capable of resisting extraordinary concentrations of fire and high explosive without giving way. Allied soldiers, conditioned and trained for months for the landings, took some days after crossing the beach to adjust to the new demands of the battle inland. Meanwhile, the Germans fought to create a perimeter to contain the invaders. Their generalship, hampered by the dead hand of Hitler, remained unspectacular. Their deployments continued to be haunted by fear of a second invasion in the Pas de Calais. Their indecision ensured that from the outset, Allied numerical superiority was always maintained. The Allied air forces had cut almost all the railways. Fighter bombers harried daylight movement by road. Yet by night, throughout the campaign, the Germans remained always able to move just enough tanks, just enough men, just enough supplies to fight the battle. Rommel's men each day performed miracles in holding ground against overwhelming Allied attacks, counter-attacking to recover lost positions, forcing the Allies to pay a bitter price for each yard of gains. The greatest source of grief to the British in the six weeks after D-Day was the difficulty of gaining Caen. In the first days after June 6th, Montgomery's divisions tried simply to break the German line defending the town by direct assault. This proved too costly and the attack was broken off. Then on June 11th, Montgomery began a pincer movement around Caen. On the left, from the positions held by the great 6th Airborne Division, he sent the veteran 51st Highland into attack. The Scots were weary after years of fighting in Italy and the desert. To Montgomery's deep disappointment, their assault failed. Likewise west of Caen, the 7th Armoured Division, the famous Desert Rats, formed the second prong of the British plan.